A very good evening aspirants, I welcome you all to the Hindu daily news analysis brought to you by Shankar AS Academy. Now before getting into discussion, I have an important announcement to you. The announcement is regarding prelims test series. Shankar AS Academy is going to start pre-stroming batch 1 for UPSC prelims 2024. The orientation for the first test will be on 11 September 2023 and the first test will be conducted on 18 September. A total of 48 tests including CSAT and mock test will be provided in the test series. The fee details are also displayed here. Kindly register to the test series immediately and try to boost your prelim score. With this exciting announcement, now let us get into the daily Hindu news analysis. Today I am going to cover important news articles from the Hindu newspaper dated 18th of August 2023. Displayed here is a list of news articles that we will be discussing today, you can go through it. At the end of the video, we will also have prelims practice question discussions. So try to watch the entire video. And a kind request to you all, those who haven't yet subscribed our YouTube channel, do subscribe and hit the bell icon button so that you will get regular notifications about our current affairs videos. Now let us get into our first news article discussion. Take a look at this editorial article. This editorial article is about the new scheme announced by our Prime Minister during his Independence Day speech. It is none other than the PM Vishwakarma scheme. Since the scheme was announced by our Prime Minister, we can expect a question from this scheme either on prelims or mains examination. The editorial covers the provision of the scheme, its advantages and disadvantages. So in our discussion today, we will see the points mentioned in this editorial in detail. Okay. Now let us start with the PM Vishwakarma scheme. See the PM Vishwakarma scheme aims to provide economic support to traditional craftspeople and artisans. The scheme aims to provide economic support by providing them affordable credit. By providing affordable credit, the scheme aims to improve economic viability of craftspeople and artisans. Okay. Now let us see the important provisions of the scheme. The scheme offers loan of up to rupees 3 lakh in two tranches to eligible individuals. The eligible individuals include people practicing 18 trades like cobblers, toy makers, laundry men, barbers, masons and choir weavers. See these loans come with a concessional interest rate of 5%. In order to make sure the scheme is implemented without any constraints, the scheme has a budget of about rupees 13,000 crore. The government aims to cover 5 lakh families in its first year of implementation. Over a span of 5 years, the scheme is expected to reach 30 lakh families. Okay. Apart from this, the scheme also has a component for skill enhancement. The scheme includes skilling programs that offer a nominal stipend. It also provides financial assistance to help artisans to purchase modern tools then aiming to enhance their skills and capabilities. Okay, These are the important provisions of the PM Vishwakarma scheme. Now what are the advantages of the scheme? The first major advantage is access to credit. See currently traditional artisans face the challenges of access to formal credit. So the PM Vishwakarma scheme addresses this challenge by providing them with affordable loans. By assessing the loans, the artisans can make investments in their trades and improve their livelihoods. Okay, so access to credit is the first major advantage. Then the second advantage is affordable credit. See the PM Vishwakarma scheme provides credit at a concessional interest rate of 5%. This makes the loans more affordable for artisans. This in turn will help them avoid the burden of high interest debt from informal money lenders. Okay. So affordable credit is the second major advantage. Then the next advantage is skill development. As I mentioned, the scheme has a provision of skill development. This provision will enhance the artisan's skills and enable them to produce high quality goods and adapt to changing market demands. Okay. Then the last advantage is that the scheme will help the artisans to increase the market for their goods. By offering financial assistance to purchase modern tools, the PM Vishwakarma scheme help artisans to tap into new markets. This in turn will broaden their customer base for their products and services. Okay, These are some of the important advantages of PM Vishwakarma scheme. Now let us see the hurdles in realizing the full potential of the PM Vishwakarma scheme. The first issue is that 
the scheme narrows its focus on credit availability alone see the schemes focus on credit availability might only address a symptom of the main issue faced by artisans the original main issue faced by the artisans is the lack of economic viability for their products and services in the market if their businesses are economically viable then formal credit will automatically reach them therefore the government by providing access to formal credit facilities without addressing the issue of economic viability will only be a short term solution okay then the second issue is risk of debt burden if the pm vishwakarma scheme solely extends loan without facilitating market expansion it could lead to a situation where the artisans and their families become trapped in debt without experiencing significant economic improvement okay this is the second important issue then there is the issue of intergenerational impact see the pm vishwakarma scheme emphasizes on knowledge transfer from one generation to the next this could lead to low paying traditional trades this in turn will limit the next generation's opportunities in addition to this this will reinforce societal inequalities particularly if such trades are associated with caste constraints okay and the last issue is implementation complexity the scheme's success depends on effective implementation the implementation of the scheme requires expertise in both the artisanal trades and entrepreneurial skills so only if the government involves professionals with the necessary knowledge and expertise the scheme will be implemented in a successful manner okay so in a sense the pm vishwakarma scheme has the potential to provide crucial financial assistance and skill development training to traditional artisans but the scheme's success in creating actual positive impact depends on addressing deeper challenges beyond credit availability the challenges include market access valuation and economic viability okay and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about the objectives of pm vishwakarma scheme then about the major provisions of pm vishwakarma scheme and finally we saw some points about the advantages and disadvantages associated with pm vishwakarma scheme so this is a new scheme so we may expect a question in both prelims and mains so make note of each and every points that we discussed now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion take a look at this news article last wednesday two tiger cubs were found dead in the buffer zone of mudumalai tiger reserve later a post mortem was conducted on the dead cub the post mortem revealed that the stomachs of two cubs were empty so there is a possibility that the cubs could have been abandoned by their mother the post mortem further revealed that there were no signs of injury and poisoning and one of the forest officials said that samples have been collected from the dead cubs and it has been sent for a forensic analysis and this is all about the news as mudumalai tiger reserve made news today let us understand some points about mudumalai tiger reserve see mudumalai tiger reserve is located in the nilgiris district of tamil nadu it is situated at the tri junction of three states including karnataka kerala and tamil nadu note that mudumalai tiger reserve forms part of nilgiri biosphere reserve the nilgiri biosphere reserve is the first biosphere reserve in india which was declared during 1986 The Mudumalai Tiger Reserve has a common boundary with Wayanad Wildlife Sanctuary on the west, then Bandipur Tiger Reserve on the north, and the Nilgiris North Division on the south and east, and Gudalur Forest Division on the southwest. Now moving on to say about the forest cover of Mudumalai Tiger Reserve. See the 2009 Forest Survey of India says that. The Mudumalai Tiger Reserve has 47.05 square kilometer of very dense forest, then 214.98 kilometer square of moderately dense forest, and 56.16 kilometer square of open forest. This is all about the forest cover of Mudumalai Tiger Reserve. Now talking about the climate of Mudumalai Tiger Reserve, the climate of Mudumalai is moderate. The Mudumalai Tiger Reserve experiences cold weather during the month of December or the beginning of January. and hot weather is experienced during the months of march and april okay this is all about the climate of mudumalai tiger reserve now finally let us see about flora and fauna of the mudumalai tiger reserve mudumalai tiger reserve has tall grasses which is commonly referred to as elephant grass then a giant variety of bamboos are also grown in the mudumalai tiger reserve apart from this valuable timber species like teak rosewood are also seen in the mudumalai tiger reserve okay Now talking about the fauna the mudumalai tiger reserve is inhabited by a variety of animals which include tiger elephant indian gaur panther sambar spotted deer barking deer mouse deer 
காமன் லாங்கூர் மலபார் ஜெயின்ஸ் குரில் வைல்டு டாக் ஜங்கிள் கேட் ஹைனா அண்ட் சோவான் தென் சம் ஆஃப் த இம்பார்ட்டன்ட் வேர்ட் ஸ்பீஷஸ் லைக் மலபார் விஸ்லிங் த்ரஷ் பீ காக் அண்ட் ஜங்கிள் ஃபவுல் ஆர் ஆல்சோ ஃபவுண்ட் இன் முதுமலை டைகர் ரிசர்வ் ஓகே and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about the location of mudumalai tiger reserve then about the forest cover and climate of mudumalai tiger reserve and finally we saw some points about the flora and fauna of mudumalai tiger reserve see this topic is very much important for your prelims exam so make note of each and every points that we discussed now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion now take a look at this small article from the text and context page it says that A study was conducted recently by the RBI. According to the study, the risk of stagflation in India is low with a probability of only 3%. This is due to improved financial conditions and stable domestic fuel prices. Okay, this is all about the news article. Now in this context, let us understand what is stagflation, then about the causes for stagflation and finally the measures that has to be taken to overcome stagflation. Now let's start with the term stagflation. The word stagflation is the blend of two words namely stagnation and inflation. This term was first used in 1965 by the British politician Ian Mesliod in a speech during the time of economic stress in the United Kingdom. See stagflation is actually an economic situation where a country experiences both high inflation and high unemployment at the same time. As we all know inflation refers to the general increase in the prices of goods and services and unemployment means the condition of one who is capable of working or actively seeking work but he is unable to find any work. Normally inflation and unemployment move in opposite directions. For example if there is high inflation the unemployment rate starts to decrease but the stagflation is unusual this is because the stagflation is associated with high inflation and high joblessness okay i hope you understood about stagflation with these basics now let us see the causes of stagflation see there are many causes now let us see them one by one the first and foremost cause of stagflation is supply shocks See unexpected disruptions in the supply of important resources like oil can cause prices to rise suddenly which in turn lead to inflation at the same time these disruptions might harm industries and lead to job losses this in turn causes unemployment okay so supply shocks is one of the cause of stagflation then the second main cause is cost push inflation see when production costs increase businesses raise prices to maintain their profits this can spark inflation and if costs increases a lot businesses might cut production and jobs which lead to unemployment so cost push inflation is one of the reasons for stagflation and the final cause is demand shortfall see if people are not spending as much due to economic uncertainty it can slow down businesses so the businesses in turn might respond by reducing production and laying off workers which in turn leads to unemployment so demand shortfall can also be one of the reasons for stagflation okay this is all about the causes of stagflation now moving on to see about the measures that can be taken to overcome stagflation The first measure is making corrections in monetary policy. See the central bank like RBI can reduce inflation by increasing interest rates. This makes borrowing more expensive which in turn can discourage spending and slow down the increase in prices of goods. Secondly, correcting fiscal policy. See the governments can increase public spending on infrastructure projects or provide financial assistance to struggling industries. This in turn can boost demand, create jobs and reduces unemployment. Then third measure is addressing supply side issues like improving infrastructure, reducing regulations and promoting innovation can help reduce production cost and in turn encourages economic growth. this eventually reduces both inflation and unemployment okay and finally developing long term economic strategies to balance growth inflation and unemployment can also help to prevent stagflation in the future okay this is all about the measures that can be taken to overcome stagflation and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about what is stagflation then we saw about the causes of stagflation and finally we saw some points about the measures that can be taken to overcome stagflation now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion Take a look at this editorial article 
recently the parliament passed the registration of births and deaths amendment bill 2023 so in this context only this editorial is written the author of this editorial highlights the major issues with the amendment bill so in our discussion today we will see the major provisions of the bill and the issues with amendment bill which is highlighted in the editorial now before getting into discussion the syllabus regarding this discussion is highlighted here you can pass the video and go through it first of all know that the registration of births and deaths amendment bill 2023 seeks to amend the registration of births and deaths act 1969 note that this 1969 act was enacted to regulate the registration of births and deaths in india now with this information let us see the important provisions of the amendment bill the first important provision is regarding register general of india see the 1969 act provides for the appointment of a register general of india see the important function of the register general of india was to issue general directions for registration of births and deaths Here the 2023 amendment bill expands the role of Register General of India further. According to the amendment bill, the Register General of India will have to maintain a national database of registered births and deaths. Okay, this is the first change proposed by the amendment bill. Then the second change is regarding registration of birth and death. See the 1969 Act specifies certain persons to report births and deaths to the registrar. for example a medical officer in charge of a hospital where the baby is born or the jailer when the birth takes place in a jail they have to report birth to the registrar here the 2023 amendment bill has a provision according to the amendment bill in case of births the specified persons shall also provide the other number of the parents if available okay this is the second major change proposed by 2023 amendment bill then the third one is regarding connecting databases as we already saw the amendment bill 2023 mandates the register general of india to maintain a national database right and this national database may be available to other authorities who are preparing or maintaining other databases like population register electoral rolls and ration card and note that the sharing of national database maintained by the register general of india should be approved by the central government this one changes proposed by 2023 amendment bill then the next one is regarding the use of birth certificates see for people who born after the bill comes into effect it is mandatory that they must use only the birth certificates to provide their date and place of birth for example currently we are using the 10th mark sheet as a proof for date of birth right so people who born after the bill comes into effect they cannot do that they must use only the birth certificate as a proof for date of birth okay Then the next important provisions in the amendment bill is regarding death certificates. According to the amendment bill for deaths occurring in hospitals, the hospital must provide a certificate regarding the cause of death to the registrar. A copy of the certificate will be provided to the nearest relative. Whereas if death occurs in any other place that is other than a hospital or medical institution, the medical practitioner who attended the person shall issue the death certificate. And the certificate issued by the medical practitioner must be provided to the registrar. Okay. See here, registrar or officials appointed by state governments for each local area jurisdiction to ensure the maintenance of birth and death databases. And the last important provision is regarding the appeal process. Now, before seeing that, let us see the organizational structure for maintaining births and deaths in states. See, at the state level, there is chief registrar, and at the district level, we have district registrar, and at the local level, we have registrars. So, if any person is aggrieved by any action or order of the registrar, an appeal can be made to the district registrar. And if anyone is aggrieved by the action of district registrar, an appeal can be made to the state registrar. Here, note that the appeal must be made within 30 days, and the decision regarding the appeal must be provided within 90 days. These are the important provisions of the bill. Now, moving forward, let us see the major issues of the bill that are highlighted in the editorial. The first issue is regarding the changes made to the role of Register General of India. Earlier, the role of Register General of India was limited to coordination and unification of registration system. But according to the new amendment, the Register General of India must also maintain a national database. Here, the author questions this expanded role of Register General of India in maintaining a central database. See, the government's argument is that the national database will be made available to authorities. dealing with the preparation of databases relating to population register electoral rolls aadhar number ration card passport driving license property registration and such other databases at the national level 
but here the author is of the opinion that this does not require an amendment expanding the role of registrar general of india as the birth and death certificates are public documents that can be easily accessed from the respective state government so the expanded role of registrar general of india does not serve any real purpose this is the first issue highlighted by the author secondly the author of the editorial questions the necessity of creating both national and state level databases of registered births and deaths the author argues that the responsibility of birth and death registration lies with state governments and asking the registrar general of india to maintain a separate central database is a wasteful exercise this is the second issue highlighted by the author then the third issue is issue of privacy according to the amendment there is a list of reasons for this national database to be shared this list is approved by the parliament the future additions to the list will be made by the government this is a major privacy concern as the new addition to the list made by the government might be more dangerous than those listed and approved by parliament for example in the future if the government plans to create a list with women who have more than two children with the intention of extending family planning service to them it can do so although the plan is well intentioned it is an invasion of privacy then the fourth issue is that the amendment has no provision to update the other number of deceased persons see one of the main aim of the amendment is to ensure efficient and transparent delivery of public services and social benefits without the provision for updating the other number of the deceased the aim cannot be attained then there is the issue of conflicting provisions while the amendment prohibits including cause of death in certificates it also mandates issue causing of death certificates to relatives so these two provisions are contradictory to one another the amendment will makes the issue of death certificates very complex before the amendment the procedure is that the medical practitioner who attended to a person before that particular person passed away should provide a cause of death certificate along with the death report and this requirement is mainly for deaths in hospitals and it was not necessary for deaths occurring outside hospitals here the new amendment made some changes according to the new amendment in the case of death occurring in hospitals the medical practitioner must issue a cause of death certificate and send it to the register of births and deaths also a copy of the certificate needs to be given to the closest family member for deaths occurring outside hospitals the medical practitioner who took care of the person during their recent illness must provide this certificate however this approach has some issues the first issue is that sometimes the medical practitioner might not have a definite reason for the person's death then the second issue is that the forms used for recording the cause of death follow world health organization guidelines so if the person was treated by an ayush that is the alternative medicine practitioner the record cause of death might not match international standards so this makes it hard to analyze and the last issue is that sometimes under treatment for one condition the patient may die from a completely different cause outside a medical facility when the practitioner wasn't available so it is not fair to expect the practitioner to accurately determine the cause of death in such cases so all these make the issue of death certificates very complex this is also one of the major issues in the amendment bill the next issue is regarding the use of birth certificates as the proof of date and place of birth for many purposes such as school admission and issue of passport the author questions the necessity of amendment to enable this provision according to the author this can be done by making changes to the relevant rules or executive orders governing them and it does not requires amendment and the last issue is that the amendment makes no changes regarding the certificate for the presumed death see when disasters or accidents happen many people could go missing and some might have passed away often the police stop searching after a while but the families of these missing persons need to wait for 7 years to ask for a certificate saying that the person is presumed dead it would have been better if the amendment allowed for a presumed dead certificate when it is likely that the person died in the disaster or accident this would help the families get death certificate sooner but this provision was not included in the amendment bill these are some of the issues highlighted by the author of the editorial and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about the major provisions of registration of births and deaths amendment bill 2023 then you saw about the issues associated with the bill now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion look at this news article here 
yesterday our president draupadi murmu launched ins vindegri which is the last frigate in the series of project 17 alpha this ship has been built by the indian navy at the kolkata based garden reach ship builders and engineers okay this is all about the news now in this discussion we shall see some points about project 17 alpha frigates see the project 17 alpha frigates were launched by the indian navy in 2019 this project was launched to construct a series of stealth guided missile frigates to the indian navy now what is this frigate See, frigate is a type of small ship owned by the naval force, which can be able to move at faster speeds. Frigates are often used to protect other ships. Okay, the frigates weigh between three thousand to five thousand tons. They are usually equipped with different weapons, including guns, torpedoes, missiles, and anti-aircraft systems. The frigates are employed in maritime security operations like anti-piracy patrols and counter narcotics missions. The weapon systems and sensors of frigates enable them to track and detect illicit activity on the sea. Additionally, frigates are utilized for humanitarian operations like disaster relief and search and rescue missions. Okay, this is all about the basics of frigates. Now, coming back to the Project 17 Alpha frigates, see the frigates under Project 17 Alpha have been constructed by two companies, namely Masagon Dock Shipbuilders and Garden Reach Shipbuilders and Engineers. Under the Project 17 Alpha program, a total of seven ships have been constructed, with four at Masagon Dock Shipbuilders and three at Garden Reach Shipbuilders and Engineers. Note that the frigates have been named after the hill ranges in India. Now the names of seven frigates include INS Nilgiri, INS Himgiri, INS Udaygiri. INS Dunagiri, INS Taragiri, INS Vindhyagiri and INS Mahendragiri. Okay, note that frigates under Project 17 Alpha have been designed in-house by Indian Navy's Warship Design Bureau, which is the pioneer organization for all warship design activities in India. The frigates have been constructed with a specific stealth design. See, the frigates has radar absorbent coatings. So the frigates developed under Project 17 Alpha are low absorbable, which can make its approach undetectable for the enemies. Apart from this, a new technology is also employed in frigates to reduce the infrared signals of the ship. This is also one of the stealth features. Okay. See, aligning with India's commitment to Atmanirbhar Bharat, a substantial 75 percentage of equipments and systems of frigates under Project 17A were obtained from indigenous firms. This includes MSMEs also. Okay, and that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about what is a frigate. Then we saw about Project 17 Alpha frigate in detail. Now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next news article discussion. Look at this news article here. Yesterday, the National Disaster Management Authority has tested the emergency cell broadcast technology developed by C dot. This technology will alert people to natural disaster through message which is the title emergency alert severe currently the testing has done on jio and bsnl networks and it is said that later the testing will be conducted at pan india level okay this is the crux of the news article given here now in this context let us see some points about national disaster management authority okay See the National Disaster Management Authority, which is in short called as NDMA, is a central government agency. It is responsible for formulating policies, plans, and guidelines for disaster management in our country. The NDMA was established in 2005 in accordance with Disaster Management Act. As it was established based on the Parliamentary Act, the National Disaster Management Authority is a statutory body. Now, coming to the objective of NDMA. The primary goal of NDMA is to create a proactive and holistic approach to disaster management that emphasizes prevention, preparedness and effective response to disasters. Apart from this, the NDMA also aims to minimize the impact of disasters on lives, livelihoods and the environment by fostering a culture of disaster resilience in India. Okay? This is all about the objectives of NDMA. Now, talking about the composition of NDMA, see under the provisions of Disaster Management Act 2005, the Disaster Management Authority has been established at three levels. That is, at national, state, and district levels. Now, if we talk about national level, the National Disaster Management Authority is the national level agency responsible for disaster management. It has been established under the chairmanship of Prime Minister. Apart from this. 
there is also a committee called the National Executive Committee of Secretaries. It has been created to assist NDMA in the performance of functions. Now coming to the Disaster Management Authority at state level. See in state level, a state disaster management authority has been created under the chairmanship of Chief Minister of the state. The state disaster management authority has been assisted by a state executive committee. Okay. Now finally let us see about district level disaster management authority. At the district level, there is district disaster management authority. They have been created under the chairmanship of district magistrate or district collector or deputy commissioner. Okay. This is all about the composition of disaster management authorities at various levels. Now moving on to say about the important functions performed by National Disaster Management Authority. As I already said, the NDMA formulates policy to guide disaster preparedness, mitigation, response and recovery efforts. Apart from this, the NDMA also performs a variety of functions. Now let us see the functions one by one. Firstly, the NDMA plays a crucial role in establishing and enhancing yearly warning systems for various types of disasters like cyclones, floods and earthquakes. These systems help in timely communication of alerts and warnings to at-risk populations. Secondly, the NDMA focuses on building the capacity of various stakeholders including government agencies, local bodies and civil society organizations to effectively manage disasters. This includes providing training, workshops and awareness programs. Thirdly, NDMA facilitates coordination and integration among different ministries, departments and agencies involved in disaster management at the national, state and district levels. Apart from this, the NDMA also works towards ensuring adequate resource mobilization both during and after disasters to support relief and recovery efforts. And finally, the NDMA promotes research and development in the field of disaster management. This includes studying disaster trends, then understanding vulnerabilities and developing innovative solutions to address challenges. In addition to this, the NDMA also collaborates with international organizations and foreign governments to exchange knowledge, expertise and best practices in the disaster management. Okay, and that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about National Disaster Management Authority, then about the objectives of National Disaster Management Authority, then we saw about the composition of the authority and finally we saw some points about the functions of National Disaster Management Authority. Now with these points in mind, let us move on to the next part of the video that is to discuss preliminary practice questions. Today we are having three questions. I will solve two and one will be a quiz question to you. Now look at the first question. This question is regarding National Disaster Management Authority. Now look at the first statement. It is responsible for formulating policies related to disaster management in India. Actually this statement is correct. It is one of the objectives of NDMA. Now look at the second statement. It is chaired by the Home Minister of India. See this statement is incorrect. The NDMA is chaired by the Prime Minister of India, not Home Minister. So second statement is incorrect. Now coming to the third statement, it is a statutory body. Actually the statement is correct. As we saw in the discussion, the National Disaster Management Authority was established under Disaster Management Act of 2005. As it was established under Parliamentary Act, it is a statutory body. So third statement is correct. Here second statement alone is incorrect. So the correct answer for the question is option B only 2. Moving on, let's take up the second question. Here four measures are given, we have to identify how many of the measures can be taken by the government to overcome stagflation. First one, adopting expansionary monetary policy by lowering interest rates. Second one, implementing wage and price controls. Third one, reducing regulatory barriers and promoting technological innovation. Fourth one, increase public spending on infrastructure projects. As we saw in the discussion, the third and fourth measure can be taken by the government to overcome stagflation. Now if we take adopting expansionary monetary policy by lowering interest rates, see lowering interest rates through expansionary monetary policy might worsen inflation instead of mitigating the inflation. It can also lead to unintended consequences in a stagflation scenario also. So it can't be a measure. Now coming to the implementing wage and price controls. See, implementing wage and price controls can be counterproductive and it distort market dynamics. So it potentially lead to unintended consequences in the stagflation scenario. So first and second won't be a measure to control stagflation. Only third and fourth can be done to overcome stagflation. Therefore, the correct answer is option A only two. This is a quiz question for you today. I will post this quiz question in a community section. Try to answer it. And the answer for the quiz question will be posted in the 
comment section of the quiz question itself you can verify the answers and displayed here is the main question for your practice go to the question write your answer and post it in the comment section with this we have come to the end of the video if you found our video to be useful do like comment and share it with your friends and don't forget to subscribe to shankaraya's academy youtube channel thank you for listening